times I've caught your name some broken night And you showed up and passed me up like you do every time I get amnesia I forget you keep coming around There ain't no way you'll ever let me down Good God Almighty Have a seat for just a minute. Bill, did you like that? Yeah! yeah, that was good. Yeah, see, that's why I get to sit through the rehearsal, the nine o'clock service, 11 o'clock service. It's amazing. So um, that was uh, Taylor, Andy, Lauren, April, and a fabulous group of singers that have performed on so many albums. You have heard their voices before. So grateful to have the group here. Hey, welcome back. For some of you, it's been a while. So welcome back. I've missed the last couple of weeks running around, um, doing all kind of cool stuff going on in our city. Um, if this is your first time, uh, we don't want it to be your last time. And we've gotten pretty good at making a big church feel like your church if you'll give us just a little bit of time. So if you're in the West Auditorium, thrilled that you're over there. If you're over here in the comfort seats over there in the West, it's pretty cool over there. If you're over here in the East, a little bit more crowded, um, right after the service, if this is your first time, or you've been coming for a while, and I get this, you kind of come and you check it out. What are these people about? Then you leave and you come back and are they for real? Some of us are for real. Some of us are posers. Some of us believe. Some of us just feel guilty. I mean, there's all kind of people. Keep your purse close. Okay, we're, <laughs> it's not the holiest group, but um, we're really nice, okay? So we're thrilled that you're here. If you wanna know more about our church, we'd love to tell you more. Right after the service, East or West, if you'll go right out here in the lobby, there's a, a sign that says Connections, and that is where some of our staff will be. would love to answer your questions about what we have for your children and all the cool stuff going on. And speaking of going on, we have a new website we've talked about a couple of times that we would love for you to check out at least once a week. And it highlights the top three things, we'll put it up here, there it is, top three, northpoint.org um, slash top three. The top three things going on any particular week because there's so much 
going on. For example, if you're in your 20s and you think, you know what, this church is for old people and people with strollers. I understand why you think that, but we have a lot, we have a lot of people that come to this church in their 20s. We have a, a group that meets every other Thursday night and they're having movie night. And so if you'll go to this website, you'll t- we'll find out about movie night, how to meet some people your age, make the church feel like more like your church. Also, this week in the top three, if you're a parent, we have some tips. This is so cool. Sandra and I wish we'd had this. Some tips on how to transition your kids back into school based on their temperament. Because I don't know if you have more than one kid, you treat them all the same. And the one that's like you, it's like it works. The other two, they're like your spouse. So anyway, so this, we have some tips. We have some tips on how to help transition your kids back to school based on their temperament. So if you go to the website, you'll find that. And then the third thing that we'll move on is in two weeks, we're launching all of our community groups, new small groups for the city. And we want you to be a part of that. But in preparation, we're looking for 30 couples that will be willing to lead a small group, a small group, uh, couples groups and 30 women that would be open to leading women's groups. And so if you go to the website, you can find out more about how to do that. You don't have to sign up, but just get more information. Or if you're looking for a way to get involved in the church, to make this big church feel more like your church, if you will just text right now, um, NP lead to um, 5125551255, um, we will send you a link about some information about being a group leader. And like if during the sermon, it's getting kind of dry, you're thinking, how long is this guy gonna go? You can do it during the sermon, okay? Just go ahead and we're, you're not signing up for anything. We're just gonna send you some information so that you can um, decide if that's for you. Some of you have been in community groups, small group for a long, long time. It's time to step up and lead one. You'll meet some fabulous new people and you will become part of their faith story for the rest of their life. So don't miss that. And last thing is our favorite thing, mask. Let's talk about mask. How many of you have already thrown them all away? You just got rid of them because you thought we're done with that. Yeah. How many of you burned them? You had like a fire and you brought your neighbors over, you burned your mask. Don't raise your hand. How many even never got one to begin with? Don't raise your hand. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, they're north of us. Anyway, um, <clears throat> okay. A little sympathy. What are you, are you, are you laughing, Dale? Did you think that was funny? It's pretty good, yeah. So, okay, imagine being me for just a minute. We have churches in Forsyth County. We have a church in Decatur, in Buckhead, Woodstock, Gwinnett County. Do you know how much grief we have gotten? I mean, in the 70s and 80s, churches split over contemporary music. They brought drums into the sanctuary. That's nothing compared to what this little piece of nothing has done to the church. It's unbelievable. So here's here's the deal. Um, I wanna make you a promise that we will do our best to assure that nobody is happy with us before this is over. Okay? Yes. So if you get too excited about our mask policy, you just wait, it's coming. So we wanna get this right. We wanna be good neighbors and we don't wanna be ridiculous, but we're kind of making this up as we go along. So please be patient with us, pay attention, pay attention to your email. If you're not getting email from us, if you just go to our website, go all the way to the bottom where it says stay informed, make sure we have your current email address and we will figure this out as we go along. This time we're gonna sing a little bit. Love for you to stand. I wanna tell you something about this song. Lauren's gonna come lead us in this. Um, I know I've, I've told you this before, but it's just, It's just such a cool thing to me that John, the uh, gospel writer John, is who introduced the phrase that God is love to the world. And you may believe God is love and you're not a Christian, but that the first time that was ever showed up in literature was one of Jesus' followers. And the reason John concluded God is love is not because the world was lovely. In fact, most of his friends had been martyred. They were all dead. He was kind of the last man standing. He determined that God is love because he determined, he concluded that Jesus was God in a body And for him, love had a name. It was the name of Jesus. And so this song is called Love Has a Name. And it reminds us of the fact that God is love isn't just a concept, that Jesus showed up and demonstrated what God is like. And John, who spent three years with him, he's an old man now. And he's like, how do I sum this up? And he decides the best way to say it is this, life isn't lovely, life isn't good, but God, is love and love has a name. The name is Jesus. So here we go, Lauren.
singing with us. Let's pray together. God, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. God, we thank you for your love that we got to sing about this morning. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that we can plant our feet firmly in your truths. We just love you so much. We can't wait to hear what you have for us this morning. This is all in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for singing with us. You can take a seat. Definitely Santa pressure. <laughs> hey, good morning to, to all of our Atlanta area churches. It's so good to see everybody back in the building, having so much fun, those of you watching online. Um, also, Lake Oconee, good to see you guys or know you guys are seeing us anyway. Uh, church, a couple churches in Florida today, tuning in, um, Alabama, other places. So it's just, it's just good to get started. Today, we actually uh, begin a brand new series entitled Your Integrity, Our World, Your Integrity, Our World, and I will explain the title in just a minute. Um, and next week, I'm gonna give you our official definition for integrity um, for this series, but for the, to just get us started, we kinda know what integrity is, right? I mean, integrity is the resolve, and really the courage, as we're gonna discover, is the resolve and the courage to do the right and noble thing just because it's the right and noble thing. You just do the right noble thing because it's the right noble thing um, when it benefits you and you do it when it costs you because people of integrity just do the right thing because it's the right thing. That is, that is the reward. Um, even when it costs you, actually, especially when it costs you, those are the people that we cheer for. Those are the heroes, the people that do the right thing even when it costs them, even when there was a less cost, a costly um, alternative. Um, you may be familiar, you probably are with this phrase, structural integrity, structural integrity. Um, Structural integrity, integrity is a building science phrase, and, and here's the, the technical definition. The ability of a structure to withstand its intended load without failing due to fracture or fatigue. And unfortunately, we have seen in recent days what happens when a structure is cracked and is fatigued and is not able to bear the load it was supposed to bear. We, we've seen the devastation when structural integrity is compromised. Um, and what we've discovered and what you know and what you've seen throughout your life just in some capacity is that the damage isn't isolated. The damage isn't isolated to the compromised beam or the compromised column, is it? The entire structure is affected because, because when, a, when a load bearing structure fails, the load is transferred. 
when a load-bearing structure fails, the load is always transferred to and potentially overload surrounding support structures. The failure of one part impacts the failure of others because the stress is transferred and the load is transferred to other parts of the building. Now, as you would imagine, and as you can guess where we're going with this, the same is true for you and the same is true for me. The same is true for all of us, that a failure, a failure of personal integrity, a failure of personal integrity adds stress to the persons around us, right? I mean, this isn't new, but this is easy to overlook, especially when we're being tempted to sacrifice our integrity because not to is gonna cost us something. And it just seems too difficult to tell the truth and too costly to do the right thing. But a personal failure of integrity for everybody, no matter how old you are, you transfer the stress to the people closest to you and oftentimes the people you love the most. A failure of integrity for one, of one family member, what happens? It transfers the stress to other members of the family. If you're a teacher or a school administrator, you get this. You got a straight A student, high B student, a top performer, you know, and academically, and suddenly they just, they just don't seem interested. They're not motivated. Their grades plummet. And your first guess is that something is going on where? At home, that's right. Um, some of you have experienced extraordinary marital stress, conflict between you and your husband or you and your wife, not because either of you had a failure of integrity, but because your high school student, your high school son, your high school daughter, a college son, a college daughter, maybe graduate school, maybe they're out, maybe they're married. And there's been a failure of integrity with one of your kids. And it's create, you feel the stress of that. It's connected to you and it's creating more stress even in a relationship because you can't agree on how to respond, how to discipline, you know, how to embrace or to stand back from a son or a daughter because of a decision they made that really had nothing to do with you, right? Companies, we've seen this. Entire companies have imploded because of the decision of a CEO or a leadership team where hundreds and hundreds of people lose their job, right? Fostering, I was foster parents. Gosh, we've seen this up close and personal. The, the, the failure of integrity with a, a, a father or a mother or, or both parents, it just, it causes kids to spiral. It, it creates in some cases generational problems, generational poverty, generational drug addiction. The, the point is simply this, the load, we just can't kid ourselves. The load is always, always, always transferred. That the consequences are never isolated, that, that your personal failure of integrity impacts some other persons. But your integrity, when you maintain your integrity, when we maintain our integrity, when I maintain my integrity, it also impacts some other persons as well. So this is a really, really, really big deal. In fact, when we think about our community and our nation, our world, our, our families, I don't know of anything that's more important corporately, nationally, Thus our title, your integrity, our world. My integrity, our world. Your integrity, your family, your community. My integrity, my family, my world. This is one of the reasons why um, integrity is actually a universal expectation. And this is very interesting. This is what makes a hypocrite out of all of us. We're gonna talk about that, I think, in week three. So don't miss week three, because everybody loves to be called a hypocrite. If it's been a while, don't miss week three, right? Here's, here's the thing. We all, we may opt for loopholes. In other words, I might look for a workaround or a loophole so I don't have to tell the whole truth or so I don't have to be completely transparent or so that you know I'm not completely honest. I mean, we might look for, look for loopholes and we might make excuses when it comes to our personal decisions. But here's what I know about you we've never met. You expect integrity from the people closest to you and the people around you. You expect it from your leaders, your preachers, and your teachers, your spouse, your boss, your employees. You expect integrity from the people around you, whether you're a person of integrity or not. Or just to be sort of crass, thieves don't expect to be stolen from. They're like, what? Well, you, you stole from me? Well, yeah, well, I didn't expect that. Well, you do it. It doesn't matter what I do. I did not expect that from you, right? <laughs> Unfaithful spouses do not expect to be cheated on, right? And don't raise your hand on oh, this one, okay? But when you were in school, not that one, we're, we're moving on, or that one. <laughs> or this could be, a, this day could end very differently than you anticipated. <laughs> But when you are in school, dog, and don't raise your hand, guys. If you, if, if you, in school, if you ever cheated on middle school or elementary school, maybe middle school, high school, college, you cheated on a test, 
And if you cheated on the test and you got by with it, nobody caught you, and you made a better grade than you were supposed to make, and then you get your test paper back. Imagine this, this didn't happen to any of us, but imagine, so you've cheated, you got by with it, you're like, man, I made a B, shouldn't have made a B, shouldn't have passed, so you're looking at your grade, and you start looking at your test paper and you realize your teacher misgraded the paper and you got cheated a couple of points. What would you have done? Oh, well, no, you would have marched right up there to his or her desk and said, hey, you misgraded. You took a few points away that you need to give to me. It didn't matter that you cheated to get them. You, were good. you expected your teacher not to cheat even though you're a cheater. Like I said, this eventually makes hypocrites of all of us. And I know none of this doesn't apply to any of you, but those employees that waste time at work, not, not us, but those are, there are, this, this happens. You know, this happens. There are people who just, you know, they shop online at work. They do all kinds of stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, they waste, they're eating up their employer's resources, wasting time at work, but, and they never tell their employer, employer, right? But when the paycheck comes out, when the hours are totaled up, when they get their, you know, their check every couple of weeks, they expect for the employer to pay them exactly what they agreed to. I mean, I may cheat you at work, but by golly, if I think you've deducted something from my paycheck or you didn't count hours, I am in your face. Why? Because regardless of our personal integrity, regardless of our consistency, it's a universal expectation. It's an inescapable expectation. And all of that brings us to something extraordinarily significant. And this is a little, this is a little deep. So for some of you who have been waiting for something deep, this is it, okay, this is, this is deep. And this is what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes because I, I didn't even plan to include this in the series, but you know, as I kind of worked through this content, I thought there, this is so foundational. And even though it's somewhat introductory, this is what I wanna talk about the next few minutes because this whole idea of the duplicity, um, the expectation we have of others that we don't even have of ourselves some, to some extent, it points to something so foundational when it comes to our lives and so foundational when it comes to integrity. Integrity, the whole idea of integrity, assumes and ought to, we readily appeal to, that we assume everyone around us is accountable to. Let me read that again. That integrity assumes, and that the fact that you, you just expect people to tell you the truth, they sign the contract, they're gonna follow through. Integrity assumes and ought to, you just ought to do that. That we readily appeal to, you didn't do what you ought to do, we need to talk about that. That we assume everybody around us is accountable to. You lied to me, you lied to me. Implication, even though we've never discussed the pros and cons of lying, I just assumed you know you're not supposed to lie. I mean, we've never talked about it. We never sat down before we signed the contract and said, okay, before we go through this contract, let's talk about what's right and what's wrong. You don't do that before you sign a contract. You don't do that before you enter into a relationship because you just, you just assume people know what they ought to do and what they ought not to do. And they're assuming the same thing about you. You lied to me. You lied to me. Well, yeah, but we never talked about whether lying is right or wrong. Well, I just assumed you know you're not supposed to lie now, I didn't decide lying is wrong and you didn't decide lying is wrong. Everybody just knows, don't they? I mean, here's something you rarely hear. I hope you've never heard this. Here's, and don't, this, I'm not suggesting you say this, but here's something we rarely hear. Yes, I lied to you, so what? Like, why, why, why are you making such a big deal out of this? But if there is no objective outside of us, sense of justice, injustice, right or wrong, think about this, why, why make an excuse for our behavior. I cheated, yeah, I cheated. So what, what's the big deal? Yeah, I lied to you, yeah. Well, why, why are you making such a big deal out of that? What, what, what we usually hear is, I didn't lie, I didn't lie. Implication, lying is wrong, I didn't lie. So, we're gonna talk about this next time. We lie about lying so people won't think we're liars. Let me go over that again. We lie about lying because we don't want people to think we're liars because we know there's something wrong with being a liar even though we did it anyway. Somehow we just, we just know, right? Now what we might hear, what probably all of us have said at one point is, now the reason I lied is, let me tell you why I lied. But why not just decide lying's not wrong? It'd be a lot easier. Then you don't have to make excuses. You go, yeah, I lied. Yeah, I cheated. Yeah, I was unfaithful. Why are we even talking about this? I mean, come on. You're holding me to an account. You're holding me accountable 
to a standard you just made up. Somewhere along the way, you just decide lying's wrong, cheating's wrong, unfaithfulness is wrong. You just made that up. That's your standard. That's your truth. That's not my truth. You can't hold me accountable to a list of things you just made up. Besides that, we never went over them. We never sat down and we, we never even covered this stuff. So you have, you have no right, you have no right to hold me accountable to some standard of right and wrong, just and unjust that you just made up any more than I have a right to hold you to my standard. But we know better, it's inescapable. We just know better. I mean, we throw, the, we throw those things out as excuses from time to time, but somehow, we just know better because as we're gonna see, there is an ought to that stands outside of you and over you that didn't originate with you. It just is. There is an ought to. And again, it's not applied universally the same way in every culture and every you know, season uh, or in every you know, generation, but there is a general sense of ought to that stands outside of you. You did not make it up and over you that didn't originate with you or me and we can't escape it. Now, here's, here's again, the hypocrisy is just, it's just amazing. We, we, um, in fact, we've all done this. We, we might deny the existence of ought to with our actions because we don't always do what we ought to do, right? We may deny this universal sense of ought to with our personal decisions because I know I ought to, but I'm not gonna do what I ought to. And I know I ought not do that, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So we may kind of dismiss and deny that there's some universal sense of ought to with our actions, but never with our reactions. We react to ought to whenever someone doesn't do what they ought to and it hurts us or it hurts someone that we love. Now, so what does all this have to do with integrity? Everything, and here's what it has to do with it. If, if there is no ought to, that stands outside of you and holds sway over you. In other words, if, if, it's, if that doesn't even exist, and if you're, if you're someone who just believes that you know, the material world is all there is and nature is all that is, I understand that. You have, you have good reason. There's good arguments to be made for that. But if that's, if that's your worldview, if, if there is no ought to that stands outside of you, that holds sway over you, that holds you to some extent accountable, then integrity, let's just not kid ourselves, integrity is nothing more than a tool that you use to get your way until it gets in the way. And then we just throw it away and we just do whatever we want to. But you promised, you promised. I, you're right, I promised. And, and when I made that promise, I meant it, but I don't wanna do this anymore. I just don't wanna do it. But you promised, I know I promised. And I, I'm telling you, in the moment I meant it, but I don't wanna do this anymore. When integrity is anchored to nothing more than courtesy or societal expectations, it's so fragile and we just discard it when it's inconvenient, when it gets in the way. And why not? It's not anchored to anything but my opinion. You sign the contract, I signed the contract. And when I signed the contract, I intended to keep the terms of the contract. But hey, a bigger opportunity has come along, so I'm out. Now, let's think about this. This is, this is so disturbing, isn't it? I know, it's, anyway, sorry. So I want us to think for just a minute about this at a national level, because the implications of this are just go on and on and on. If there is no, if there is no ought to that stands outside of us and holds sway over us, Integrity is reduced to a tool government uses to get its way until those particular rights and wrongs and just and injustices get in the way. And then whoever controls the government just decides, no, 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 from now on, this is right and that's wrong. We just, we, cause we just, we just make it up. So determining what's at the bottom, and again, whether you're a theist or not, a religious person or not, a Christian person or not, this is for all of us. This, is, this impacts all of us. This impacts all of us every day. This impacts all of us today. Before this day is over, this dynamic is gonna come into play in your life. In fact, for some of you, it's coming into play right now because you're thinking, why is he talking about this? Because I've had my mind made up and I had sort of built up a case and built a case for what I'm gonna do and got ahead of steam. As soon as this is over, I'm gonna go out there, we're gonna have that conversation and I'm gonna do what I ought not do. And he's talking about this. How did he know? 
your husband called me. That no, I, I, it's just because <laughs> this, is, this is just the reality we wrestle with every single day. This tension isn't gonna go away. So determining what's at the bottom or the foundation of integrity, if there's an anchor at all, what it's built on has huge ramifications because if integrity, if integrity is not connected to anything, if it's not supported by anything that actually exists, if it's not grounded in anything other than our opinion, and if it's not grounded specifically as we're gonna see in the divine, then again, let's not kid ourselves. Integrity, integrity, what's right and wrong, ought, ought not, just, unjust, noble, virtuous, it's, it's fluid, right? It's fluid. It will be defined and redefined by personal and public opinion. It's just gonna be defined and redefined by majority rule. Okay, now let me ask you this question and I'm gonna let you vote on this in a minute. <clears throat> and don't, don't leave, okay? <coughs> don't, and don't, just to make the point, should women be allowed to vote? <laughs> should they? Well, let's, just, let's just vote, okay? If you think women should be allowed to vote, let's just <laughs> raise, a, raise a hand. Do you think women should? This is not a trick question, guys. It's like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's my question. And don't answer this one out loud unless you're sitting by yourself somewhere, okay? You're driving. Why should, why should women be allowed to vote? Based on, based on what? Now, I know what it's based on. For me, I don't wanna be locked out of the house this afternoon. So I'm all for women voting, okay? <laughs> but once upon a time, the majority said no. And then the majority said yes. And if there's nothing more to that topic than the majority, where does that leave us? Somebody says, what about the constitution? Well, that's another good illustration. What are the rights? Again, you don't have to answer this out loud just to get us thinking. Are the rights guaranteed by our constitution? Are they anchored to anything other than the opinion of the authors? Let's take another one. This is, I know this is so emotional, but slavery? I mean, many thought it was right and just and moral because it was natural. And many in the world today, we can't even comprehend this in, in, our, in our way of thinking, in our Western way of thinking, right? Modern way of thinking. But many in the world today think it's right, it's moral, it's just, and it's natural that some people were born to be ruled and other people were born to rule. It is as natural and as clear to them as the opposite is clear to us. We don't think that. Way, but who's to say? And what if the majority swung the other way? Would you swing with it? If not, why not? Let me dig a little bit. Do you just think you're better than all those people in other parts of the world that think slavery is fine? You think you're better than them? Are you, you think you're just naturally, morally superior to them? Or is there more to it? And if you think it's wrong, based on what? And the outrage at the very thought is an appeal to an ought. It just happened. You just, you just know. There's something that's like, Andy, I can't even believe you're talking about. I mean, this is disturbing to even talk about. I just, I just know. And you wouldn't even have to come up with reasons. Even if you gave me four reasons why slavery you know, is wrong and immoral, and I shot all four of them down when the conversation was over, you wouldn't be convinced. Which brings me to this. Does your outrage rest on anything more substantial and less fluid than your personal opinion or even a personal conviction? Because a personal conviction is just an opinion that you, you know, say louder with more angst, same thing, right? Or your life experience. Well, in my life experience, okay, so what? You had a life experience. Everybody has a life experience. I mean, come on, is the foundation for your moral outrage over something like slavery? Or we could go right down the list. There's so many things. What, what's it founded on? What's it grounded in? I mean, I know it just seems self-evident to you, but behind the fact that it's self-evident to you, there are people all over the world that is not self-evident to them. So who's right or is there a right? Or do we just get to make this stuff up until it, it's inconvenient and we decide we wanna do something else? So if there's no ought and ought not that stands outside of us and holds sway over us, then right and wrong, just and unjust, it's just determined by majority rule in the case of a democracy, but it's determined by minority rule in the case of a dictatorship or a fascist regime or a theocracy. People with the power, they just make stuff up. They decide what's right, what's wrong, what's moral, what's immoral. But 
It's even worse than that, okay? It's even worse than that. And you're thinking, how could it be worse than that? In fact, just say, how could it be worse than that? <laughs> yeah, I know, thanks for asking. How could it possibly, I mean, this is terrible. Here's why. Because if there is no divine lawgiver, if all there is is what we see and what you see is what you get and that's it, then we can't even hold the people in power responsible. We, we can't judge them because there's no objective standard by which to judge them. I'm just judging them based on my opinion, my truth, my life experience, the way I was raised, what I, you know, and I'm just, I'm holding them to an account. I'm holding them accountable to a standard they never subscribed to to begin with. And I don't want them holding me accountable to a, you know, a standard that I never subscribed to to begin with either. So we're at a stalemate. And it's even worse than that, because if there is no objective standard by which to judge, if, if all there is, is matter, they actually had no choice in the matter because matter doesn't decide, matter just is. Choices, decisions require free will. And in a pure, you know this, in a purely materialistic world, there's, there's no free will. I mean, free will is an illusion. It's a trick of evolution. It's not actual, it's not real. We experience decision-making, but we're not actually making decisions because of physics and chemistry, natural law, it can't decide anything. It just, it just is. So at the end of the day, the, the people who see the world differently than us, we can't judge them. We're holding them to accountable to something we just made up unless there's an ought to that we're all accountable to that holds sway over us and judges us. If that doesn't exist in the end, it really is just survival of the fittest. Evolution by natural D, selection. If there is no divine and if there is no divine lawgiver, it's just self-serving opinion. It's just majority rule. And integrity just becomes a useful tool to help other people feel guilty and to hold them accountable and to meet our expectations until it's not. And then in the end, ought to, it's just up to you. Ought to, it's just up to me. But we know better. We know better. We know better. Even if you aren't sure about a personal God, you know better. Even if you walked away from God, I mean, if you've read all the books in your personal experience day to day before this day is out, you know better. There is something outside of you that's bearing down on you. And here's the amazing thing. And this is what I don't think I can convince all of you of today, but if you'll hang with us for the next few weeks, I hope someone or something will convince you. The moment, this is so amazing to me, the moment that we attempt to justify a behavior in our minds, okay? Think about this. We've had this we're gonna have one of these before the day's over. The moment, the moment you try to justify a behavior in your mind, I shouldn't, but I'm going to. I should not tell her that, but I'm gonna tell her that anyway. I, you know, I shouldn't lie. I should show them. I should, but I'm not. I shouldn't, but I am. The moment, this, as soon as you enter into that internal argument with yourself, you acknowledge the divine whether you believe in it or not. You acknowledge accountability to something that you did not create and you can't shake. Paul, the apostle Paul, um, he explained it different and better um, and his is a lot shorter. So I'm just gonna read you his, but you know, I get 30 minutes. So I just couldn't read this and dismiss. Okay, but I will tell you, this is, this is better. And he's writing, he's writing to Judean and Galilean um, Jesus followers. They're, they're new Christians, um, sons and daughters of Abraham who were raised on Torah. They were raised on the law. I mean, and, and here's something we can kind of understand if we stop and think about it. Their conscience, these first century, um, second century too, but especially these first century um, um, Judeans, um, Galileans, sons and daughters of Abraham, their consciences were fine-tuned to the law of Moses. 
I mean, fine tune. And sometimes your conscience can be too active, like you're too sensitive to things. So like 10 years, I know we can't get off on this, but like 10 years after the resurrection, it's such a great story. 10 years after the resurrection, Peter, who's been with Jesus the whole time, the whole ministry, Peter gets to the door of Cornelius' house and Cornelius is a Gentile and Cornelius has invited Peter over to talk about Jesus. I mean, isn't that what Peter's supposed to do? Like go ye therefore into all the world. How about you just go up the street? Okay, this isn't like a big deal. Actually, it's a you know, day and a half journey. He's invited to Cornelius' house 10 years after the resurrection, okay? This is a guy who had breakfast with his resurrected savior on the beach and Jesus said, go into all the world. And he gets to Cornelius' house and it's like, oh. and he later says, he says, this is the first time, first time I've ever been in a Gentile's home. It's like, what? Yeah, because their consciences were, there was fine-tuned to the Torah and to the first century teaching of what, how Torah was supposed to be lived out. So when these Judeans and Galileans, sons and daughters of Abraham, when they realize these Gentiles, people like most of us, are beginning to worship their God and are gonna follow their Messiah and embrace Jesus as their Messiah as well, they were like, okay, wait, wait, wait. This, they, what, this, how are they gonna do this? They don't even know Torah, okay? They, they, didn't, they don't even go to synagogue. I mean, they know nothing. How in the world are they gonna live a life that's pleasing to God when they don't have the law? So Paul's like, that is a great question. So here is an answer. Here's what he says. When Gentiles, talking about most of us, who do not have the law, because they, they just didn't grow up with it. They don't have it in their hearts, their minds, their consciences aren't fine-tuned. When Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively things required by the law, when they, as they begin to follow Jesus and they become more honest and they quit stealing, they quit cheating and they quit you know, cheating with their measure and their weights you know, doing in the marketplace, when they begin to live better, more ethical, more moral lives, um, they, he says there's something that's intuitive. There's something that their conscience begins to be more fine-tuned, not to Torah, not to you know, the law is given to the, the Jews. He says, but God's doing something on the inside. They just know those things are wrong. He says, when that happens, when they're like, suddenly, you know, that didn't bother me before, but now I'm like, I'm not doing that anymore. Remember Zacchaeus? It's like he stole and stole and stole and stole. Then he meets Jesus, like I'm giving it all back plus some. It's like, whoa, what happened? What did you read? I didn't read anything. I just met Jesus. I didn't have to read it. It's like, suddenly my eyes are open. I see the world a different way. He says, Paul, when that happens, they are, he says, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law. They have a law. They don't have the law, they don't have Torah. But where did that come from? Where does this enlightenment come from? Where does this sense of right and wrong that suddenly their eyes are open to? Paul says, they show, he says, I've been around, I've, I've, you know, I've been all around the Mediterranean basin, you know, inviting Gentiles to following Jesus. Here's what I've discovered. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. They show that the requirements of the law, not the sacrificial law, the how you treat other people law, the, the, the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences, their consciences are becoming, are starting to get fine-tuned to the divine law of God that's for everybody. And then here's something we all experience every day. And their thoughts, this is so interesting, and their thoughts sometimes accuse them. Isn't that weird? It's like your body is moving in this direction because you've decided what you're gonna do and your thoughts go, don't do that. It's like, Wait, who's, how many of me are there? Okay, I just like had a thought that conflicts with the direction of my body and I'd already made up my mind. So do I have two brains? He says, no, there's an internal tension now because they've been awakened to the divine law of God. Their thoughts accusing them at other times, defending them. Good job, good job, good job. Yeah, you're probably not gonna get a bonus now, but you did the right thing, you know? She's in tears, he's in tears, your kids are upstairs crying, but that was a conversation you needed to have. Good job. Gentiles who didn't have or know the 10 commandments are condemned by their conscience and encouraged by their conscience anytime they intersected with the law of God, whether or not they had the official law of God. So ought to, ought to is not completely up to you. And ought to is not completely up to me. There is an outside agent. And this is huge. I just want you to think about this, especially if you're not, Christian or used to be, or rethinking it. The moment, the moment we attempt to justify a behavior in our minds, we acknowledge the law of God written on our hearts. 
You say, I don't believe in God. I'm not saying you should or that you do. I'm just telling you. You've been wrestling with ought to your whole life and you thought it was conditioned and societal conditioning. And certainly there's certainly some of that, right? But I'm just, I'm just telling you, you have experienced, and Apostle Paul talks about this in other places, you have experienced the divine. You, you have experienced an encounter with a God who loves you, who has written his law on your heart. And you know you didn't make it up and you can't escape it. And you made a big, 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 bad decision. And the only way to assuage your guilt and your conscience is you had to start making other bad decisions, right? And your heavenly father says, come back, come back from the ledge, come back from the brink. And I want you to wrestle with this because to wrestle with your conscience is to wrestle with me because I place my law in your heart. The moment we attempt to justify behavior in our minds, we acknowledge the law of God written in our hearts. The rule of God, the kingdom of God. This is why I love to say that everyone should consider following Jesus because Jesus came to planet earth and he ignited and he launched and he initiated the rule and the kingdom of God on earth. And he placed his law in our hearts. And when you do the right thing, when you do the costly thing, when you do the thing that costs you financially, costs you relationally, costs you reputationally, costs you some followers, now you're not gonna get invited back. Now you're not gonna get invited in. Now it's, life's gonna be different because you did the right thing. You have intersected with the divine because you obey the law of God written on your heart. You have participated in it. These are Jesus words, I love this. You are not far from it. So we're gonna talk about integrity and in, from lots of different angles, but to get started, it's anchored to something beyond our fluid opinions and it's anchored to something beyond anyone's fluid opinions or majority opinion. It's informed by a value system that stands outside of us, that stands over us, that puts pressure on us. And it represents what's best for us. And it represents what's best for the people around us. And the reason you know it's what's best for you is because when someone treats you the way they ought not treat you, you appeal to the law of God in your heart and you appeal to the law of God that you hope is in their heart as well. It's, it's more than simply being a good person. It's living in sync with the will of God. When you do what's right and it costs you, you declare the rule of God over you. You're not just making a good decision. You're not, this is what's so amazing. You're not just doing the right thing. You are declaring the rule of God over you and you are participating in the kingdom of God, whether you meant to or not, and whether you believe in God or not. And when you insist that other people treat other people justly, and when you insist that you, other people treat other people right, and when you insist that other people treat other people fairly, you're participating in the kingdom of God as well. So wrapping this up, integrity. We expect it. You can't not expect it. We celebrate it. Every time you see it, you celebrate it. That's, those are the heroes, right? And we can't escape it. But the questions is, is this, the questions are, are these, I guess. How do you get it? For some of you, how do you get it back? How do you guard it? How do you model it for your kids? That's what this series is all about. So don't miss part two of your integrity, our world. Next time, we're gonna talk about how to position integrity as your guide. So I hope to see you then. But before you go, three questions to keep the conversation going or to get the conversation going. Parents, my goodness, my goodness, please figure out a way to have these conversations and ask some of these questions with your children. And if you have answers to the first two of these questions, these are the legendary stories that should float generation after generation after generation in your family because when kids see their parents and grandparents get it right, it does something in their heart. Question number one, have you ever done the right thing because it was the right thing and paid a price as a result? Was it worth it? Your kids need to know those stories. 
Grandkids need to know those stories. Number two, have you suffered personally because of someone else's lack of integrity? Yeah, this is just a reminder, right? Over lunch, you know, every small group can tell those stories. And then number three, would you commit Proverbs 11.3 to memory? This is gonna be our key verse throughout this series. I would love for you to commit to memory. There's several different translations. I memorized it in the NIV, but I'm gonna teach it out of the New American Standard Version. It says this, the integrity of the upright will guide them. We're gonna talk about that next week. But the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. So this is a big topic. It's as big as our lives. It's gonna intersect with your life before this day is even over. It's as big as our community. It's as big as our country. So in addition to participating in the series yourself, I hope you will share it with some friends. It may make all the difference in the world to them. It may keep them from doing something they ought not do simply because somebody was talking about what they ought to do. They may be on the verge of a decision they will regret for the rest of their lives. And you could be the catalyst to keep them from moving in that direction. I'd love to pray for us and we'll go. Father, thank you. Thank you. Father, thank you for, for those of us who grew up with parents who just maintained their integrity, integrity throughout. It just inspired us. It just set a pace and a pattern for us. Father, for others of us who are digging out of a hole, we just never saw it. We didn't ever see it modeled. We, just, we never saw anybody suffer because of doing the right thing or doing the right thing even when it cost them. So we, we just didn't have that category. And here we are kind of clawing our way forward. Father, wherever this lands with us, give us the wisdom to know what to do with it. And then give us the courage to do it. And I pray that as followers of Jesus, that we would lead the way because our Savior, our Savior died for our sin and took away all of our excuses to live any other way. So Father, again, wisdom to know what's right, courage to do it in Jesus' name, amen.